Well, this phrase, nostalgia for paradise, I, I don't know who invented it. When I, I first encountered it in Merciliad's book, uh, Cosmos and History, which if you've never read this book, it's a little book. It was one of the most influential books on my thinking because I saw there a whole different way of talking about uh, uh, spiritual reality. Uh, but I disagree with Iliad that it is uh, simply a, a attitude in the human mind. I really think there was a, a fall and that this is a diminished condition and that there was some kind of cohesion that we do have this nostalgia for. That's why I think our whole relationship to drugs is all about the fact that I mean, look here. Here's the metaphor. Uh, we're like the children of an abused relationship. Something was taken from us 15,000 years ago. It was the thing which kept us in balance with each other, with the earth. It kept us in our imaginations, in the poetic world of natural magic. And then it was taken from us. And it was a big downer. And life turned into history and warfare and subjugation and classism and all of these things. And, uh, and the thing that was taken from us was, was this intoxication. And so then we moved on to alcohol, to money, to opium. Uh, because that was very big in the Minoan phase. I mean, opium w had a huge influence on Minoan civilization. Uh, and all of these things, an effort to scratch an itch that you can never quite reach. And, but in the meantime, all kinds of addictions, wars, criminal syndicates, horrible things go on. Uh, now, in the 20th century, through the science of anthropology, a complete inventory, essentially, is taken of the world's uh, intoxicating possibilities. It's part of a complete inventory of the world's people, languages, technologies, uh, belief systems that characterizes anthropology. But there it is. In 1953, Gordon Wasson returns from the village of Watla de Jimenez in the Sierra Mazateca, and he has the body of Eros, you know, pickled in a jar, lost since the fall of Minoan Crete, but suddenly restored. And then nobody knows what to make of it, and the CIA looks at it, and Hoffman looks at it, and, uh, and now it is found, I think. And uh, I don't know if it comes too late, or if the final irony is that we learn what it was all about, but nevertheless have to succumb to the momentum of our own stupidity. In other words, it's some kind of Greek drama where you have this horrible realization and fully understand the whole bit, but you're doomed anyway just because it makes for better theater. Or whether it is the, you know, the preferred, the happy ending of the Christian eschaton. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what the ninth century's best tools were uh, for cognizing these kinds of matters were uh, scholastic theology. And I, I've been accused of that, been accused of that. Uh, <clears throat> so what scholastic theology says is that there is something called uh, the nunc stands, the, the, the eternal now. And that somehow, well, it, this all goes back to this wonderful thing which Plato said. Plato said, time is the moving image of eternity. And uh, my notion of what this is all about is that the time wave we looked at last night is, is eternity. It's the fractal structure of the temporal module viewed from a higher dimension. And then time is the traversing of that thing. The nature of the singularity is hard to anticipate. If you use the old fractal principle of ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, do you all understand what that means? It, it's the phenomenon of that a fetus, as it develops, ontogeny, recapitulates the evolutionary history of life on the earth. 
that's uh, phylogeny. In other words, the, the fetus is first a little kind of a thing, an amoeboid mass of cells, and then it becomes sort of like a salamander, and then it becomes like a, a, you know, a, a primitive mammal, and so forth and so on. Well, using that principle to try and anticipate the end state seems legitimate in the fractal, under the fractal dispensation. However, it leads to the conclusion that when you look at an organism, what happens to all organisms is that they die. So then does that, that leaves you with the conclusion that what happens at the end date of the, of the, the whole enchilada is the equivalent of some kind of mass dying. Well, then that really doesn't tell you much because we don't know what dying is, you know. We don't know whether that means that how can the ultimate novelty be complete extinction? It must be then that we have to overcome as positivists our phobia against this area of speculation previously presided over by beady-eyed priests and actually take it back and say that in the mysteries of metabolism and morphology, it is perhaps now necessary to entertain the idea that death is not ne a nihilistic release into non-entity and that instead the shamanic model is correct and that l biological life is a sojourn into matter and that at death, you know, you do go to some incomprehensible unfoldment only the first moments of which can be made sense of. Because I really think the DMT thing is like bungee cording into the bardo. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, there you go. And then just as you're, it jerks you back. And, uh, and so you get that much of a look into the yawning grave. And I take it as... A, it's strange, yes, but surely reason for hope and optimism. Uh, how much of oneself, whatever that means, is going to be carried over, it, I don't know, but it looks to me like probably not much. And, and that, but what lies ahead is, well, to, to quote uh, Bilbo Baggins, uh, <laughs> the greatest adventure still lies ahead. I'm pretty convinced of that, uh, which surprises me because I'm a cynic and, a, and a, you know, I'm not easily swept into optimism. <laughs> <laughs> My, yeah. Well, you just had a, a great little pre echo. Your uh, analogy with scholastic theology lets us know what is going to be the defining event of 2012. The collected works of uh, Terence McKenna are published under the title Summa Mycologica. <laughs> I'll take it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, what what cautions and reservations do you advocate in like this this dance with Kali? And I, I mean, we, we talk about the revival of the <coughs> and and sometimes I wonder if we remember what we're talking about. And that, that in this in this possible great ecstasy there lies in some danger. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm conscious. I'm constantly asking that question as I, I've taken a four and a half year break from drugs and moving back in that direction and having consumed some mushrooms recently and, and wanting to, like, in this revival of, of, of the use of these substances, I feel like I need to be absolutely reverent and to, uh, and to be sensitive. To, um, to what I'm doing. Okay. Well, there, the danger, I mean, the, as I see it, and I feel it very strongly, and I don't, you know, the danger is, uh, just to put it out there, is madness. I mean, we talk about stretching the envelope, we talk about running the edge, but you don't want to rip the envelope. You don't want to island yourself in a, situation where nobody can make sense out of what you're saying and yet that's the game we play is always pushing so 
what you said about reverence and absolute impeccability of attitude. And also, I think it's very important to be physically together. You know, I mean, I, it's important to be physically together anyway. I go to a gym three days a week and I think of it as pre- preparation for psychedelic voyaging because if your body is a clean instrument, uh, you can do it. The other thing is uh, technique. I mean, in the psychedelic state, if there are problems, there are techniques to deal with them. The best technique, and uh, Western people don't um, naturally gravitate toward this, but if, if you get into a place you don't like on a psychedelic, uh, sing. You must sing. Uh, most people's tendency is to clench. This is very bad because it can just grind you to nothing. What you have to do is you have to sit up and you have to sing, and it doesn't really matter what you sing. You will find the song. I mean, start out with row, row, row your boat and go from there. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, you know, the real issue I find in myself is surrender. That it's all very fine to sit here getting paid dollars per minute extolling this stuff. But boy, is it different to do it. You know, you can talk all you want, but um, the... The thing is so, I don't know if scary is the word, but it's such a, it's so total what happens. And you're so vulnerable and you know that if there is any flaw, if there is any flaw in your approach or attitude, that that flaw will be magnified by the stress of the thing and become highly problematic. So it's all about asking the question, you know, Am I ready? Now, this is not a. This is not how how beginners approach it, nor should they. It's incredibly forgiving, of uh, of first, second, and third timers. But as it takes you in, what it gives is a certain measure of, for want of a better word, let's call it power, and the payback on that existential validity would be another way of calling it rather than power. The payback on that existential validity is that you have to be okay. And, you know, maybe it's my Catholic upbringing or something, but one cannot do the examination of conscience carefully enough because there is, there's always flaw. So it's about, you know, staying right with it. It teaches the right way to live and also surrender. That's why I don't ever have an agenda. I regard having an agenda as as essentially aspiring to be a magician of some sort. And I don't. I don't. I want to witness it. I am perfectly content to be present at the miracle. I don't want to do the miracle and I don't want the miracle to be done to me. I just want to, to be there. Uh, Frank Herbert, in his book Dune, said something which over the years I've found, though it sounds flimsy to say, it actually works. You, some of you may recall that in that book they had this drug called Stroon, and it did pull you out through time. It was not just a drug. It, it revealed, like I'm saying psilocybin and DMT do, uh, the real structure of reality. And in there they discuss what do you do about the fear that comes with the the gigantic, awesome dimensions of this vision. Uh, And he says, uh, or someone tells uh, the main character, fear is like a wind and it blows through the mind. And what you must do is you must wait. And it cannot sustain itself unless you give it an object. And... Uh, this is actually true, I found, that fear, whatever it is, cognitively, physiologically, it's a chemical wave of release of adrenaline. And what you do is you just sit and watch it come like a bell curve and then recede, and then you're still on the surface of the ocean and the power of it has been defeated. But if you 
if you give it any object to cling to, you know, it will break white water and then the chaos will overwhelm you.